Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 140. We started off last week grappling with the monumental event of Jesus dying on the cross. Yeah. And the synoptic Gospels show that many more miraculous things besides like the earth shaking the temp uh, the curtain in the temple tearing completely in two it matthew says that tombs were opened and and many bodies of saints that had been asleep were raised so more of a testament to the legitimacy of who this jesus figure was to the first century jerusalem when this event happened and it was interesting convicting that you had these roman centurions in the text saying like they were giving testimony like when they were witnessing all of these miraculous natural events happening after his death saying truly like this man was innocent or truly this was the son of god wait this is real yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah and we moved on from there where um they were Within their culture, it was the day of preparation within Passover, getting ready to be the Sabbath. And um, you have this new figure in the story. It was um, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a respected member of the Sanhedrin, comes to Pilate and asks him for Jesus' body. And uh, Jesus, or uh, Pilate, you know, relents. He is okay with it. And then Joseph, along with Nicodemus that we had seen earlier in the Gospels take Jesus' body, place him in this tomb. They prepare it in the same way that you would see a highly, highly respected king with the amount of spices and oils and everything that they brought uh, with them to lather on Jesus' body. Like, in no way would they bring hundreds of pounds worth of that if it wasn't meant for a king in their eyes. And then they wrapped him in a linen cloth, a shroud, and they uh, they rolled the stone away. And the text shows us that there were witnesses to that event happening between Joseph and Nicodemus, which was the two Marys. Yeah, and it, oh, so okay, you may, you may, as we've entered into this part of the story, you might think, "Gosh, I don't know." It sounds like these guys are bringing up a lot of little nitpicky details. And I can guarantee you it's only going to get worse. But if I could say it's not exactly our fault because we're just trying to bring up, you know, a bunch of the little things that people notice or argue about or have problems with or whatever. We're not going to answer everything. We're not going to bring it all up. But, you know, it's just there's so many. You try to bring a few of them in and it feels like, man, you guys are getting all nitpicky. But we're not meaning to. We're just trying to be somewhat thorough. Well, let, let's go on with the story because he's in the tomb. Everybody's trying to figure out, my goodness, what are we going to do? I'm sure people, they're, they're just in some sense kind of losing their minds. This is not the way it was supposed to go, you mm-hmm. know, but let's go on. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, verse 56. It's short. Let's talk about this. Luke writes this. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So Luke, uh, he's he's just trying to continue the story that we've been talking about, but he adds something that's sort of, you know, unique to himself. He goes on a little bit about what the, the women were doing. It says that they went back to their homes or wherever it was they were staying. And the way Luke states it, you would think that they had time before sundown to prepare more spices and ointments. And let's just say, I mean, when you look at it, that's a reasonable reading. But remember how we were talking 
that, well, gosh, you know, the sun's going down. They had to go get permission from Pilate, and they're trying to do all this burial ritual stuff. It kind of felt like they were running out of time. So this feels a little bit weird and contradictory. And so let's just say this. It's also reasonable to not try to take Luke's words, the the couple of sentences here, so literally or as if they are meant to be in a sequence or whatever, you could look at it and say, listen, somewhere in between when they were putting him in the tomb and when they were going to go back and visit after Sabbath, okay, there's time in there that isn't exactly Sabbath, and so they could have been working on spices. And Luke could simply be saying, look, he's just noting that when it was time to honor the Sabbath, they did that. And when it wasn't, well, they were busy working on spices and ointments or whatever. So and, and just the, the simple part is think about Saturday night when the sun goes down, Samuel. Is it Sabbath anymore? No, it's it ends uh, right. Saturday at sundown. Yeah. Technically, at sundown, you would call that Sunday. Well, it could have been that that evening they spent some time working or whatever. So all I'm saying is, we're trying to create this mental image of what did it look like? When, you know, when did they do what? And Luke, the way he's chosen to say it or word it might add a little confusion. You know what? Whatever works for you in your head, just kind of go with it. It's not like we're messing up the story. Just understand that people, they get really serious about, no, 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 wait a minute. They did this. They had to do this. There had to be time for that. And other people are like, dude, relax. They could have done this on, you know, Saturday night. They could have just don't worry too much about it. We're actually going to see more text about it as we go. And maybe it'll maybe it'll clear it up for you. Maybe not. But I'm just saying this adds a little confusion. Now, all over the city, just remember, people are doing the Passover Seder. They're remembering God's salvation from Egypt while God's salvation from sin and death is actually happening in real time. That's amazing and shocking to me. I love that. But just think, I just picked a few words, Samuel, but think of how these apply to both the salvation from Egypt and what was happening to Jesus, okay? That when when they're doing the Passover, they're remembering the haste with which they had to prepare to leave. They were hasty in trying to get him into the tomb. Remember the affliction that they were under. And of course, Jesus was suffering a lot of affliction here. And and humanity is under affliction, if you want to think of it that way. The bitterness that they experienced in Egypt and all the bitterness from so many different perspectives here. The deliverance from Egypt and, of course, the deliverance for all of mankind. They're doing all of this in memory of what happened in Egypt, but they're also possibly unknowingly at this point they're they're doing all this in in sort of honor of what's happening to their messiah whether they know it or not so mm-hmm. i don't know it's just kind of a neat image got anything before we go on um you said that we'll dre- address this more in a bit so if this question fits better with what you're going to bring up later then by all means just tell me to can it for now but are we supposed to look at the, the synoptic do- gospels in their timeline of the Passover in in a way that are we treating Jesus' disciples as already celebrated the Seder or are we j- just for the sake of like going through the synoptic gospels in this account we should treat it as they have not observed the Seder yet Yeah. See, this is the difficulty that we raised before. We had this big contradiction where John versus the synoptics, one made it sound like they were going through a Passover Seder, the other did not. And here we are, they're going home. And and the the, the whole story is that the, the lambs are being slaughtered at the same time Jesus is. Right. And we we actually saw once we got to this part of the story, that seems to have some some credence throughout and so uh, and we even posited that idea of well there's a couple of ways that this could have happened and here's what they could have done or you know what maybe they were you know treating it like a seder even though it wasn't the correct day i just so many things 
And Samuel, the answer, the, the honest answer is, well, we don't know. We don't really know. But at this point in the story, it does appear that all of the Gospels are trying to sort of push us toward that idea of, hey, we are, in fact, on the the Passover day, the lambs are being slaughtered, same time Jesus is being crucified, they're going home, they're going to have this meal, all of that. So I, in truth, we're just kind of going with the story because we can't answer that question. There, mm-hmm. It's just a huge contradiction here, here in our Gospels. Yeah. And like you said, we don't know, but I'm just thinking like how incredibly difficult it would have been if they had not done the Seder yet for them to <laughs> go through that ceremony together after right. seeing their Messiah, their friend, their teacher dead. Like the Seder isn't like our normal like church communion that lasts like 15 minutes like a Passover Seder can last somewhere between two and four hours <laughs> yeah um, easy and gosh that would just be so hard to do that yeah it's uh but but then again you never know if they did in fact go through it that may have been some of their first moments of understanding mm-hmm. you know maybe trying to piece together little bits of how the they're celebrating the redemption from Egypt, and possibly, possibly, I'm totally making all this up in my head, possibly noticing how there are hints of the redemption, you mm-hmm. know, through Messiah. So I don't know. But yeah, it's hard stuff. Hard. Yeah, I don't think anything we're going to see coming up is going to talk about any of that, Samuel. Okay. It's just, yeah, this is, this is just hard. Mm-hmm. So we're going to move on. Now we're going to switch back over to Matthew. This is chapter 27, verses 62 to 66. And it says, The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Okay. Now, there's good information here. There's also problems here. So let's start with, uh, okay, it's Saturday. It is the Sabbath. And that's really important because think about that. The chief priests and the Pharisees go to meet with Pilate on the Sabbath. Already that's weird. But... Samuel, I know you talked about this before. What little people group has all of a sudden shown up that's been conspicuously missing for a while? Uh, The Pharisees. The Pharisees, yeah. All of a sudden, it's like they had disappeared from the story. Like, wow, why why aren't they involved in this? Well, now they're back. So were they involved before? Maybe, probably, I don't know, whatever. whatever. But anyway, they're back. And then it says, not it says, They have a new request for Pilate, okay? And it says that they remember that Jesus had said, after three days, I will rise. Now, I personally think that's really funny how all of a sudden they know what he meant. Because the only time that he was talking with them using this kind of language, that at least we see in the text, he had a little bit of private time with his disciples. But for them to hear, the only time was when he was talking about this temple, And so all of a sudden, it's like they know what he meant. Now, I don't know if that's because they are really thinking that way or this is Matthew's presentation of the story or whatever, but it's just funny. All of a sudden, they knew that he meant he would rise in three days. So they call him an imposter. And what's important for us in a biblical context, what they're trying to convey is he is a false prophet. That's what they're saying by imposter. 
But anyway, they want Pilate to secure the tomb until the third day because he said he would rise by then. And if it, you know, whatever, that, that'll be enough time. They want to be sure that no one can sneak in and steal his body and falsely claim that he's risen. If someone did that and got away with it, well, that would make his fraud, this imposter's fraud, even worse, which, I mean, true, right? Totally makes sense. If you were them, it's like, hey, make sure they can't do this because that would that would be super bad. Now, Pilate, we've talked about this before. Okay, uh, he probably couldn't care less, but he tells them you have a guard. And this is another difficulty. You have a guard can be taken two ways. And we've mentioned this before. The Jews had temple guards and, and other, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them soldiers, but understand they are ruled by Rome. So they weren't soldiers in the same way that Rome had soldiers. Okay. But they had their own guard. They had, you know, some, some weapons they were allowed to protect the, the priesthood, Sanhedrin, temple, stuff like that. Now, we could take it that Pilate is telling them, Hey, do it yourselves, as in, go use your own guard. So when he says, you have a guard, it's like, yeah, go use your own. Make it as secure as you want. And and they could have done this if they'd wanted to. They didn't even need permission to do such a thing as this. And so again, we see, yeah, but they wanted Rome to do it. Now, Pilate, though, the other way of taking this is that Pilate could have given them a guard, As they requested, Uh, here you go. You have your guard. So when he says you have a guard, it's like he's he's acknowledging. Yep, I'm giving you one. Go make it secure with them. Okay, it could be either one of those two. If we sneak ahead just a little bit to Matthew 28, 14, you know, there's a little section about trying to bribe the guards to, you know, for the, the right, tell the right story, all that kind of stuff. That seems to favor our option two here. That, that Pilate actually gave them the guards for protection. Because why else would you bribe him? You're trying to protect them from Pilate, whatever, not, you know, falling down on their job. So whichever it was, here's the real point. They sealed the stone and left a guard in place. And technically, I tried to look. I got various numbers. So I'm just going to say uh, we're not sure how many are in a guard. It wasn't a single guard. It doesn't mean that. It it means some number, but I'm not going to go ahead and say a number out loud, but you know, just, just figure it's a few. Now, here's what's important though. This is going to conspiracy theory and all this stuff. Just to say it out loud, Joseph and Nicodemus put him in the tomb, rolled that stone. So it was closed up. Those were the four witnesses that saw that happen. But like at a minimum, that was 10 or 11 hours ago. Could have been even more. So all of that time has passed without the tomb being sealed and without a guard in place. So for those who want to say that his body was stolen, even modern day people, but they're saying it just like the lying leaders will, we'll see here soon. Well, This is an important time of opportunity. I mean, come on, we've got hours here where he is left unattended. Now, of course, we don't believe that, but we acknowledge, okay, I got you. There definitely existed an opportunity for someone to steal his body. We acknowledge it fully and completely. However, I just want you to think about a couple of things. If you think that Matthew included this story as proof that his body wasn't stolen, or some might say that he invented this story as proof that his body wasn't stolen. Well, Samuel, doesn't that make Matthew seem just a little bit dumb? (laughs) I mean, surely he would have had the guards there immediately and not the next day. So this was not Matthew trying to cover something up. I mean, it just, it's too big of a hole. That just would have been dumb. Additionally, you'd also have to believe these guards were pretty dumb. Samuel, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. You're a Roman guard, and you've been sent to accomplish a task. 
presumably by Pilate himself. He sends you out there and he says, hey, you go out there and you make sure that no one steals that body. Samuel, when you get there, what is the first thing that you would do before you sealed that tomb? Check to see if the body is still there. (laughs) Exactly. How stupid do we think these people are? (laughs) Stupid is a stupid does, Lieutenant Dan. That's right. So it, it doesn't explicitly say it in the text. I acknowledge that. But come on. Matthew isn't that stupid. These guards aren't that stupid. They almost assuredly checked to make sure the body was there, and then they sealed it up. So in the end, the whole story about they stole his body, that whole thing, honestly, it's just a lie. It's an invention. It's it's to discredit Jesus, the the disciples, the apostles, the story, all of it. And here's the kicker. That story started 2,000 years ago when Jesus was literally still in the tomb. Hmm. It's been told repeatedly for a couple thousand years. And to be quite honest, the people that tell that story, what they're trying to do is attack our faith. And when you just think about it a little bit, it takes great faith to believe that somebody came and stole that body hmm. just to, to make up this whole mess that we call Christianity. So I don't know. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. What do you got there, Samuel? Yeah, I'm. I need your help, Paul, because I feel like I'm noticing a discrepancy in Matthew's text. Um, well, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> so you you had said just a few minutes ago, like it, this, Matthew's story kind of alludes to ten or eleven hours passing without the tomb being sealed. But how are we supposed to treat earlier in? Let's see, Matthew 27, verse 60, and said, And laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Is that not sealing the tomb, or is that supposed to be something different? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is something different. I don't know what the material was or how they created it. I probably could have looked something like that up. I'm sure somebody somewhere has ideas about how they did it. But no, that was an actual, what's the right word? A compound of some kind. They they literally, so to roll the stone to close it is one thing. To roll the stone and then add some sort of seal around it. And I mean, just, just for conversation purposes, just imagine wax or something. That's just a way of, I mean, it's like when, what do you see in those spy movies? Somebody puts a little piece of paper in their door. So when they come back to it, they see that somebody's been in their room or something. (laughs) So you put a seal on this rock so that uh, even if, let's just say, for example, the guards got distracted or something, anything that you could imagine could have possibly happened. Well, you could come back and immediately see that the seal had been broken. Uh, so, yeah, it's two different things. Okay, gotcha. Anything else? Uh, no, no. All right. Well, uh, let's keep going because the story doesn't stop here. We're moving on. Well, the next little bit, it's kind of funny. We're getting these little isolated bits from each each guy. Now we're going to read something from Mark. It's in chapter 16, verse 1. Oh, uh, <laughs> God, I did just think of something. I'm oh, so well, sorry. Then, no, that's good. Do it. Are we supposed to treat those chief priests and Pharisees that came to Pilate with this concern as doing it without violating the Sabbath? Like, because I, because I presume that they would have to travel to go to where Pilate was located at. So I'm just right. wondering, like, are they still doing it within their hyper religious letter of the law observance or? Was there, you know, opposition being an enemy to Jesus go as far as they would violate the Sabbath to achieve their purposes? Yeah. And that is a great question. That's kind of why I right at the beginning of that, I kept pointing it out. Look, it's the Sabbath. They're going to visit Pilate on the Sabbath because 
they do have all these strict rules. They would have had to walk some some fair distance. Whether it was enough to violate or not, I really don't know. But it it had to be. I mean, if there was a line and edge of you are just about to break the Sabbath, man, they had to be dancing on the edge of it. You know what I mean? If if they didn't just outright violate it. But I think it is also reasonable to think that their their uh, mental state, the way that they were viewing this whole situation, I think it's also reasonable to think, you know what? They could have outright violated the Sabbath mm. just because they they are they are in a tizzy. Mm. Could I say it that way? Mm? Yeah. Yeah. Can can members of the Sanhedrin be in a tizzy? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, we don't really know. But I I think it's reasonable to say, yeah, it's possible. In the language of the Gen Zers, all this is feeling kind of sus. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So what do you think? Should we go on to Mark now? Yep. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, it's good. Let's do it. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 says this. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Okay. It's very short. So here Mark shows us that the time after sundown on what we would call Saturday, okay, it technically in, in Israel, that would have been Sunday at that point, but let's talk the way we think of it. Sundown on Saturday, it was used by the women to prepare the spices. And so this adds to, remember the question we had, well, did they actually prepare some of the, like, was there time between when they sealed, uh, not sealed, I, <laughs> I almost <laughs> messed up, when they closed the tomb the first time and when they, you know, had their their uh, Sabbath meal or Passover meal, whatever, whatever was going on at that time, any question we had about the timing, okay, Luke's language, kind of, sort of seems to be addressed here or answered here. It is possible. Maybe the women did begin preparing the spices a little bit when they got home before the sun actually set, but they totally honored the Sabbath. And then afterwards, what we would think of as Saturday night, after the sun went down on Saturday, they finished preparing the spices for anointing. And so I, to me, this kind of sort of harkens back to, hey, you know what? Sabbath is so important in God's eyes. Sabbath is so important you don't even work on the temple, you honor Sabbath. In the same way, Sabbath is so important, you don't even perform burial rites for the Messiah. <laughs> Instead, you honor the Sabbath. I just think that's kind of a neat little mm -hmm. imagery there. Now, additionally, uh, this kind of adds to the thinking that Joseph and Nicodemus hadn't completely finished their work. Hmm, maybe, maybe not. We we talked about it that way as if that was a real possibility. You got to wonder, though, and, and, and this, this is what I think. If Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of spices, why did these women need to buy more? I mean, what was that all about? Let's talk about a couple things. We mentioned before that the spices were partly intended to reduce the odor. Now, some suggest that since Nicodemus only used myrrh and aloes, at least that's what it mentions in the text, Nicodemus only used myrrh and aloes, these additional spices may have been more suited to the task. I mean, we might even wonder, you know, I mean, here we got these, and let's just say it this way, we got these two rich guys, and they... They offer this incredible display of love and de devotion to what they consider to be Messiah. And though that is awesome in so many different ways, I mean, could it be? Could it be that it actually kind of exposed their lack of experience or expertise on how to prepare a body? I don't know. Maybe we could say that I'm just asking for a friend, I, but it could be that Maybe Joseph and Nicodemus, it was tremendously heartfelt and wonderful in that way, but maybe it wasn't the best preparation for burial that's ever been done. I don't know. It's, it's just an interesting thing. 
One important inference from this text, though, and and again, I think this is, we need to see this. There was, at least by the people that we're talking about, there was zero expectation that Jesus was going to be risen, resurrected, whatever. After everything that he had said, all of that stuff, in the moment, it doesn't appear that anyone expected this to happen. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. But again, it shows how, first of all, awesome hindsight is and how it can also be deceiving and and kind of throw us uh, a little off course because it's so different to be there, to be in it. Mm -hmm. They're not dumb. This was just crazy and unexpected. Now, I also wanted to issue a warning before we actually get to this next bit. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. We'll leave room for you to ask any questions or whatever, Sama. But I just want everybody to know the eyewitness accounts that we're going to be reading all through here, man, they are about to get messy. So you're going to have to hold on to your seat. Samuel, go ahead. What do you got? I don't have anything. Hold on to your butts. Let's go. All right. Well, the next little bit then, what are we covering here? It's Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, Mark chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, Luke chapter 24, verse 1, and John chapter 20, verse 1, and really only about half of it. But uh, let's see. I think I'm going to read, actually to cover it, I'm going to read both Mark and Luke. So here's Mark. And very early, On the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? This is Luke now. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Okay. I'm not going to read them all, but it, th- this is kind of amazing. Mark says that the sun has risen. Matthew and Luke have it, I mean, at least as early dawn or, or only toward the dawn. And John has it still dark. And Matthew, his is actually even a little bit, it's a little bit of controversy because a lot of scholars contend that the wording of Matthew, I mean, when we're when we're actually looking at it in the Greek and sentence structure and all that stuff, it literally means Saturday night. And again, we've talked about that. That's technically Sunday, but Sunday began at sundown. And, and it's not like, instead of thinking of it as the dawn, when it says toward the dawn, instead of thinking of it as the dawn of the sun, Think of it in terms of like the dawn of a new day. And so, I mean, this is kind of crazy. Reading these these four little sections right here, all we can really be certain of is that sometime after sundown Saturday night, which is technically Sunday, Jesus was raised. I mean, that's it. We can't be any more specific than that. Now, Matthew has Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Some think that that is Mary, the mother of little Jim, uh, which they they consider to be separate from Mary, the mother of James, as in Jesus's brother. So I, whatever, we can't solve that dilemma today. It's Mary Magdalene and another Mary. And and Mark agrees, but he includes Salome, which was the, <laughs> I called her the mom of thunder. <laughs> she was the mom of the sons of thunder, right? Now, Luke uh, he just says that it's women from Galilee, so I'm sure it may have included these same kind of women, but it could have been others. Who knows? Whatever. And then John, oh my gosh, he's got Mary Magdalene alone. So, I, you know, we're just going to have to go with, it was some faithful, devo- devoted women. That That's who was there. So it, it's just a difficulty. The eyewitness accounts, they they get crazy in this part. Now, if we're trying to put this all together... We got to say, okay, so whoever it was, whichever women, and whenever it was, you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning, before the sun, after the sun, I don't know, we know that they wanted to anoint the body with additional spices. That part was clear. And they were concerned about the stone 
that was closing the tomb or, you know, whatever, over, over the entrance to the tomb. Their concern was, who's going to roll it away? And, I mean, Mark, somewhere, did we already get to the part where he said that it was very large? I think that's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. So they're concerned about the stone, and it seems, now think about this, they have seemingly no idea or expectation of the guards being there. No idea or expectation of the fact that the the stone is not just there, but it's actually sealed, all those things. So we've got, you know, the, the timeline of the story. We have to try to piece this together ourselves. These women showing up don't know about any of that. They, they in their mind, they're probably just imagining we're going to go there. The stone's going to be there in the same place it was when we went there Friday, right before sundown. And but other things have happened. So anyway, there's that. What you got there, Samuel? So we should uh, expect or have in our minds that as these women are going to see the tomb, that the guards should be there and that the seal should have been placed on the stone. Yeah. I mean, think of it. Uh, these women, uh, let's pretend they are at the tomb Friday afternoon. It's almost sundown. They see everything happen. They're witnesses to all that. And then... However it is they do it, maybe they prepare a little bit right before Sabbath, and then they do all the Sabbath stuff. Uh, but after the Sabbath, they're buying more spices, they're preparing more things, they're doing all this. While they were having Sabbath, the Sanhedrin was going to Pilate saying, hey, give us a guard, and the guard was showing up. So Friday night, Saturday morning, they're doing Sabbath all day Saturday, Saturday morning, the guard shows up at the tomb. And then Saturday night and onward, they're preparing spices, going to the tomb, whatever. So, yeah, they are all there. Okay. Does that timeline seem clear? Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, if what is going to happen here coming up did not happen, at least at that point when the women got there, there's no way to say, like, I can't imagine those guards they wouldn't have allowed those women to even go in there, right? Because if if the uh, if the stone had been sealed, then that means that they weren't going to let anybody break the seal, correct? Yeah. Or w- or would they lo- allow it to be broken and then close it up and reseal it again? Uh, yeah, I think any of that is possible. It is the third day when they come back, and so it's difficult to know how they would have responded. Mm-hmm. And it's made worse by the fact that that isn't what happened. And, right. you know, we're speculating or <laughs> whatever. So, yeah, I mean, again, in their mind, they didn't know any of that. They just were trying to figure out how we're going to get that stone moved. Mm. Who knows how the Roman guard would have responded? So, so, I mean, it's a good question. It just can't answer it. Right. Anything else? Nope. All right. Well, it's going to get a little crazy. Matthew chapter 28, verses two through four. Listen to this. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Seal officially broken. (laughs) <laughs> so so Matthew fills us in on what's happening before the women arrive. Now he's okay, let me rephrase that. English translations are pretty consistent in calling this a great earthquake. Now you may hear that and think, well, that's gonna be kind of difficult for these women or anyone else to not be aware of that. And for what it's worth. Now, I'm not saying that the translations are bad. I'm just saying the word doesn't have to be translated as earthquake. It could be something a little more generic, like there was a great shaking or there was a great stirring or something like that. The only reason I bring that up is to say that, well, whatever it is Matthew's talking about, maybe it really could have been something that was much more localized, right? And and I'm just saying, when we imagine earthquakes, we imagine, man, you can feel that for miles. A great shaking 
if it was, you know, kind of local, well, maybe they could have been on their way there and not personally experienced anything of it. Then again, maybe they did experience it and it's just not in our text or, you know, whatever. I'm just saying something happened. Uh, Something else the English translations are really consistent with is that they use the phrase an angel and not the phrase the angel. And here's why that's funny, because in the Greek, there is no article. I mean, literally, if you were trying to be super literal, you would say there was a great earthquake for angel of the Lord descended. You just wouldn't say an or the, or anything. You would just, right? So the point is, it could be either, technically. Now, here's why that's important. Some argue that the angel of the Lord never appears again after Jesus's incarnation. That's a really interesting argument and and study point, right? It's That's kind of interesting. And so, then, well, it really needs to say an angel and not the angel. However, there are others that argue, "Eh, that's not quite right. We do have some evidence. You know, admittedly, we have to look carefully to see it, but no, the angel of the Lord does in fact appear. Now, this verse, uh, and specifically we're talking about verse 2 here, and Matthew chapter 1 verse 24 are kind of like the the staple verses in that argument. So they're going to argue, no, 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 it could be the angel of the Lord. Now, we can't be certain either way, and probably there's a part of you that doesn't care. Okay, I get that. But I got to say, for me, just, and and again, we talk a lot about painting that mental imagery for yourself. Just for fun, I actually really do like the idea. If we were to think of it as the angel of the Lord, to me, that's like God, you know, let's say the father himself coming down to open up that tomb. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's what the text does say, or that's how we should read it. I'm saying, well, you know, it's, it's a possibility. It's, it's at least in the realm of reasonable. And I really, I like that imagery. I like that. Again, it's only speculation, my preferred speculation. No solid defense, but whatever. So I'd throw that out there so you know there's at least some controversy about that. Uh, Let's see. A a little side note. I thought I would mention this, Samuel, because the text is so specific. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. You look at that word in the Greek. It's interesting that the English translators so often choose descended because... It could very easily, and I would think in so many other circumstances, would just be translated as came down. The angel came down. And because we've made such a point about how, yeah, it's only God that can come down. God comes down to condescend to creation and humanity, right? Here we see that caveat that we talked about before, that angels being sent with a miss uh, a message or sent on a mission that is another way of coming down but that's not the one that that they're talking about in Jewish thought okay uh, and then of course the other possibility is hey it really should be the angel of the lord or something like that because in that case it is god coming down condescending so anyway there's all that just thought I'd throw that in there now apparently uh this very great stone that uh, we're going to hear very specifically about in the next section. This very great stone, it's nothing for this angel. He just rolls it back all by himself. And just to kind of play the victor, he just sits on it. He owns that thing. You know what I mean? And, And then Matthew mentions that his appearance is like lightning, which might hearken us back to Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. It was talking about an angel that was like lightning. Uh, and his clothing was white as snow. And that's uh, maybe another one. We go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, when he's talking about God. These are consistent and various descriptions of either God and or his angels. And they might also remind us of the description of Messiah in Revelation. I mean, it starts way at the beginning, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, but we'll see that a number of times throughout Revelation. The point is, This angel looked to be not of this world, and it was scary. 
the guards trembled with fear. In fact, they were frozen in place by fear. They couldn't fight or flee. And some, some even suggest that this is trying to tell us that they were unconscious. Now, I think that's a reasonable interpretation. I just don't agree with that one. I think that they were conscious through all this, but you know, whatever. People argue about stuff like this. So you paint your mental imagery, try and piece this together. Before we go on, Samuel, anything? I guess I'm curious to hear why you're not on board with the the unconscious interpretation. Just the language in verse 4 seems to suggest like trembling has some kind of conscious nature to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, you know, I, I guess I don't have any like technical defense or anything like that. I, I think in my reading, you see many people trying to describe how they imagined what was going on in these guys. And you see two very distinct camps, ones who, when they are reading this and trying to say, this is what they're trying to communicate. These guys are, you know, they're frozen. They're laying on the ground. They can't do anything. They're, they're, uh, again, I, I would call it frozen in fear. And then you have a, another camp who's just very much on the page of, yeah, these guys were out. They were unconscious. They weren't experiencing any of the things that were about to follow. I guess in my mind, I lean toward they were conscious because You know what I think it is, Samuel? I think it's because if they were unconscious and they said, hey, nobody stole the body, it just disappeared or, you know, it was just gone or this angel came or whatever, that's not as believable as, well, here's the thing. I saw this crazy angel and then I was unconscious. Well, then what Mm -hmm. happened? Well, maybe people came and stole it. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So maybe that's what's going on in my head. But uh, I don't know. Somehow along the way, I just fell into, I fell in with the camp of those guys who were leaving them conscious, just frozen in fear. Gotcha. So that's really all. Yeah. Just curious. Doesn't make it right. Uh, Anything else? No? Mm Mm-mm. All right. So the next little bit, kind of short. Well, we're covering Mark chapter 16, verse 4. Luke chapter 24, verse 2. And in John, we're going to go back to 20, verse 1, and we're just going to grab the second half of that again. Uh, I'm kind of ignoring John at the moment. We're going to read from Mark. It says this. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. It's probably important to say the they in this verse is not the guards. (laughs) It's the women. You're continuing the the story. So the other Gospels have the women arrive uh, seemingly unaware of the earthquake and seemingly unaware of the work of the angel. They merely see that the stone had already been rolled away. So Matthew's telling this story uh, all about the angel doing all this stuff. And we're going to see Matthew in a second where the women show up. But here in these other Gospels, it's like they don't know anything about that. Not in their stories. That stone's just been rolled away. And Mark goes ahead and finally tells us that it was very large, inferring that it would have taken some substantial effort. So the women show up. No matter what story it is you're reading, the stone's already been rolled away. And Matthew continues. Okay, like we'll see in a moment. Matthew's going to continue to have the angel sitting on that stone. But Mark, Luke, and John don't. I mean, they don't even have the, the angel in there at least Not in that same way. Now, from John's account, we get the idea that Mary Magdalene arrived first. I remember John said it was dark, but I mean, it was obviously light enough to see a little something. So maybe they had all agreed to meet at dawn and she was just a little early. And and as we'll see later, she may have left without waiting for the others. Again, this is eyewitness. We've got contradictions. It's going to be weird. But the point is, these guys, the, 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 the women show up. They see that the stones rolled away. They're starting to put this together in their head. Oh, my gosh. What's going on? Anything there, Samuel? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, 
This next one, it's kind of long. The commentary is anyway, so this may be the last bit we do. But here we go. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 7. Mark chapter 16, verses 5 through 7. And Luke chapter 24, verses 3 through 8. And man, I'm just going to have to read bits from all of them. So here we go. Matthew says this. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See. I have told you. Okay, so remember, in Matthew's story, angel, big angel, scaring the guards, rolling away the stone, all that thing, boom, and he's talking to the women. That's their story. In the other Gospels, that's not a part of what we're seeing. So here's some important things from Mark. The women are there, and in Mark 16, it begins with, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. Now, we're going to find out that this is an angel. So the women have to walk inside to see that. And, you know, they go through the thing. Don't be alarmed. He's risen, the whole story. And Mark also adds, but go, tell his disciples and Peter. How interesting that Mark isn't considering people, uh, Peter part of the disciples. That's kind of weird, right? We'll talk about that. And then in Luke, we get to, uh, let's see, in uh, verse 4, he says something about while they were perplexed about this, that is the stone and the no body, whatever, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. So now we got two angels inside the tomb. And Uh, Let's see, Uh, John, uh, I'm sorry, Luke also says this other thing. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. So a lot of stuff going on in this story. So first of all, let's go back to Matthew's angel. All right, he is scary. We've talked about this before. Is every angel scary, Samuel? Uh, a lot of them are. <laughs> right, right. Not every single one, but a lot of them are. First thing out of his mouth, do not be afraid. This happens a lot. You go through your scripture, you're going to see it. Sometimes, and we would argue seemingly most of the time, angels are awesome and scary creatures. Mark, though, He just has a young man in a white robe inside the tomb. And we we, we read this. We talked about Luke has two men inside the tomb in dazzling apparel. And we're going to see that John kind of agrees with uh, Luke later. But the story is different in John. It's all it's all it's all a mess. So even though they didn't appear as these big, awesome, scary angels to them, they, they just look like men, which, okay, sometimes angels seem to do that. Even though that was the case, it was still alarming. It was still frightening for the women. So whoever it was with the women, a big angel, a single young man, two, two men, whatever, they speak. And the story, you know, it's mostly, mostly consistent. It says, number one, you have come to see Jesus who was crucified. And then the question Why do you seek the living among the dead? And then he is not here. He has risen. And look at where they laid him. So all of them, you know, that's like the the collection of everything everybody said in their in their text. Now, if you were one of those women, Samuel, would you be freaked out by this? Mm, Heck, yeah. Would you be confused by this? Heck, yeah. Yeah, it's it's all kind of crazy. All kind of crazy. Now, here's the thing. All right, we're going to get back into some of the places where people struggle. Samuel, Jesus was dead, 
And many people have have looked at this many different ways. These are these are the numbers that were compelling to me. Jesus has been dead somewhere between 29 and 40 hours. Can you imagine, Samuel, how many people struggle with this being three days? Within our Western mind, Western culture and concept of time, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. Now, we've already talked about this. We explained, you know, there's sort of this accounting idea. And and it went something like this. Hey, he died on Friday and he was raised on Sunday. So if you count this way, Friday plus Saturday plus Sunday, well, that's three days. The partial days count as full days. Now, I know some people look at that and they go, oh, cool. That totally explains it. Other people, they struggle with that. That's not right. That doesn't make sense. Part of it is because it's 2023 and we live in America, a Western culture and all of the history that's before it. But even worse, here's one that messes people up, Samuel. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. You know what? You read that. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right. Now, Samuel, if we take that verse literally, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How many hours is that? Uh, That's 72. Yep. Oh, that's a problem, right? (laughs) And then technically, Samuel, think about this. If he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, well, then when would he be raised? The the day after the third night? Yeah, he'd have to be raised on the fourth day. Oh, my gosh, this is terrible. What are we going to do? Well, it completely contradicts every other scripture that speaks of the third day. So we got to understand a couple things. There's a little bit. We talked about this back when we went through Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. But anyway, there's a little bit of a textual problem in that Matthew's line about the three days and three nights, (laughs) it might not even be in the original text. We have uh, scribal notes that talk about this. And so that's a little bit of trouble right there. Also, just stop for a second. Read in context. In the context, Jesus is teaching about signs that they've asked for, and judgment. And so he's using Jonah's generation in Nineveh and saying that they're going to judge this generation of Israel. So it, it isn't absolutely required that we take the three days and three nights to be literal because the focal point of his statements wasn't the death and the resurrection. That's not That's not really what he's talking about. He's trying to help them understand them asking for signs. He's trying to understand judgment. He's trying to help them understand even the generation in Nineveh versus the generation of Israel, all of that. So it's, I mean, if you do take it literally, I think you've got, you've created more problems than you, you meant to. And then second, I just think that we don't need to take it literally. So you can do what you want with it. But anyway, there's that. Uh, I'm going to go on. They, they continue Uh, One of the other things that they told him, I think this was in the Luke one. Remember how he told you, even back in Galilee, that number one, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And number two, he must be crucified. And number three, and on the third day, rise. Now, you could go back and read this, Luke chapter 9, 22, Matthew chapter 17, 22 and 23, Mark chapter 9, 30 and 31. What they were told here is that they remembered. They did remember. Now, can you even imagine the brain activity going on in these women at this moment? (laughs) Hearing these words, seeing the empty tomb, trying to piece it all together. I mean, that, I mean, I I know when I experience things like this, man, my, it feels like I actually literally have gears in my head and they are just spinning like crazy. (laughs) It's tough. But finally, They're told to go tell the disciples, uh, again, number one, that he is risen from the dead, and number two, that he is going to Galilee. In fact, he, that we're talking about Jesus now, he's going to be there before you, but you will see him there. And number three, this is important, just as he told you. Samuel, why don't you read this one? Because it's, I just think it's amazing. Mark chapter 14, verse 28. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Yeah. 
We actually read that, went through it in the text, all that kind of stuff. But can you see how somebody would have said that at a time and you might have heard them, but it wouldn't have really had the impact. Whereas now in hindsight, remembering those words, you're going, oh my gosh, he said that he was going to be raised up and he was going to go before him to Galilee. And you're telling me that this is real. He's not in the tomb. He's been resurrected and he's going to Galilee and we're going to go there and see him. What? I and mean, it's, it's crazy. Now, at this moment, they're probably, on one hand, excited to share this news. But, um, you know, there's that also that firestorm of emotions there. Who knows? They might even be shaking with excitement, fear, confusion, joy. I don't know. All that stuff. But Samuel, can you imagine being them? Can you imagine trying to get someone to actually believe you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds impossible. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Now, uh, again, I mentioned it before. In Mark, it says the disciples and Peter, as if Peter was somehow distinct from or uh, among the disciples. I don't, it's hard to, I don't even know what he's trying to say. But remember this, Samuel, Mark is a disciple of Peter. So when we're reading Mark, we're kind of reading Peter's version of the story. So if Mark is the one that's saying the disciples and Peter, well, there's a couple ways that look at this. We could say that, well, maybe Peter is still considered like the ringleader, the main dude, the number one disciple, the rock, right? Could be that. Or could be that Peter no longer considers himself as among the disciples in this moment mm. because he denied him. Uh, considering Peter's personality, which, I mean, he is like the walking definition of extremes, right? <laughs> I kind of lead toward Peter feeling like an outsider. This is the way Peter used to tell the story. This is the way Mark conveys it, because in this moment, Peter's not feeling like he counts or qualifies or is worthy to be called a disciple. But who knows? I mean, you know, we're kind of reading into it, and I'm not going to live or die on that hill, but I'm just saying it's reasonable to see it that way. So, whoo! We're a little over. We should stop there, but let's leave you some space. Do what you want to do, Sam. Don't worry about time. Yeah, super, super cool section here. Um, it's something that I picked up on that I probably would not have gotten this kind of context that I'm going to bring up without having to get without us going to Israel and experiencing the land and the distance and everything. Like, oh yeah, but it's. A, for them in the first century, it would have taken them approximately seven days to walk from Jerusalem to Galilee. Like for us, it, it's like a two, two and a half hour bus ride on, you know, interstate going decent <laughs> distance. But like as a multi-day trip. So like I, I know things are about to get weird between the accounts after this. But just in this moment now, like, of course, th th this is a crazy spiritual experience witnessing these angels seeing the body not there hearing their words but at this point with what he what the angel is saying like he is going before you to Galilee and will meet you there like that takes that's taking a step of faith for the women and then going back to the disciples to say like we still haven't seen Jesus his body's not there we we met an angel and he says to meet Jesus in Galilee like that's it, not immediate gratification in terms of like their hopes being realized it's still that 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 is a quite a time to be wrestling with all of these things that a bunch of women come back came back and told them so yeah and and yeah well we're gonna see all of that weirdness and tension yeah. in the stories that yeah. were coming up but oh yeah so true mm -hmm. anything else I don't think think so i was really hoping that i could c connect our own midrash to like uh abraham and his visitors in genesis after he had got circumcised but i was looking back in genesis 18 and it's three visitors instead of two with uh oh. luke and john so i was like dang it well if we added theirs together oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> no nah. yeah but but see, that's kind of cool, too, because that was two angels and then a third angel, which we were 
led to believe back there that that was in fact the angel of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's yeah. I mean, there are connections, but not maybe not what you were looking for. Anything else? I think we're good. All right. Well, let's end it. Okie dokie. Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a five-star rating and review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.